Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kaylee. I am one of the librarians here at Metro Public Library. And I am going to pass this over to Todd Arrington, who is the site manager right down the street from us at the James A. Garfield National Historic Site. Thanks, Kaylee. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me again, uh, Kaylee, and everyone at Mentor Public Library. It's always great to be with you. Um, and this is a, a, a special one because it is Black History Month. And so Frederick Douglass, who, of course, was a contemporary of James Garfield, seems like a, a perfect person to discuss for this, uh, this, this designation. Before I forget, I will, and the only reason I'm going to say it now is because I remember it. And if you ask me in, you know, 45 minutes, I may forget. The subject of next month's talk, since Kaylee just mentioned it, is going to be Lincoln's first inaugural address. So if you're interested in the, uh, in the program for March, uh, it will be about Lincoln's first inaugural and that will be me speaking again. So if you wanna know about Lincoln's inaugural, you're gonna have to deal with me for uh, another month. And if you are, have had enough of me, um, I certainly won't be offended if you, uh, <laughs> if you decide you don't wanna to, to come to that one and listen, hear my voice yet again. So, um, so, um, so this, uh, the subject today, of course, as I mentioned, is Frederick Douglass. So as I always do, um, I, I will go through the slides. Uh, I, I will tell you a little bit about what you're seeing. Uh, I will leave time for questions at the end. I'm by no means an expert on Frederick Douglass. Um, and this is obviously because we only have, you know, less than an hour, really, uh, a very, very sort of cursory look at his life. He was one of the most famous Americans of the 19th century and, and potentially really for, for all of American history. So there's a lot to say about Frederick Douglass. So this is obviously by necessity going to be a rel relatively shallow look at his life. If you are interested in knowing more about Douglass, um, I would recommend the relatively new biography by David Blight, B-L-I-G-H-T. Maybe they have it at the library, I'm not sure. Uh, Blight, of course, is a is a very well known historian at Yale. I think it's Yale, and that book, which I believe is about two years old now, did win the Pulitzer Prize for biography. So um, it's it's very well written and it's it's quite hefty. So if you, if this shallow look at at Douglas's life today uh, inspires you to want to know more about Douglas, um, you could certainly pick up Blight's book. Of course, Douglas himself wrote several autobiographies and other things. Those are always great, uh, great resources as well. The other thing I'll say is there is one slide in this presentation that does have a, shall we say, racially charged term on it. And it is a quote from Frederick Douglass. So it's Douglass himself using this particular word. Um, so I just want to warn people, you know, that, that you will see that. Um, and it's a particularly ugly word, frankly, but um, it is, I think, relevant to the history. And it, because it was a quote Douglas himself made, it's not somebody calling him this, it's him saying this himself. Um, it did feel like it was relevant to, to leave it in there, but I just wanna let people know that it is there. So it, it's not meant to be offensive, it's just meant to be uh, a good comprehensive look at the history. So without further ado, let's uh, dive into a little bit about the life of Frederick Douglass. And some of you may know quite a bit about Douglas. Maybe some of you read uh, the Blight book or other biographies. Douglas is a fascinating character. He's born enslaved in Maryland uh, on the Eastern shore of Maryland. And if you look on the, uh, the screen there, you see the red box uh, that kind of shows you the, the area uh, in which Douglas was born. He was not born Frederick Douglas. He was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. And he didn't, as, as was the case with many enslaved people, did not even know his own birthday. He sort of knew approximately when he was born. He knew it was around February of 1818, but he never knew the exact date. And so he, at some point, just kind of chose February 14th as his as his birthday, whether or not he was, you know, a romantic at heart and that because that's Valentine's Day, I don't know. But uh, at any rate, he celebrated his birthday as February 14th of 1818. But imagine going through your whole life, not knowing your own birthday and really not even knowing exactly how old you are. Um, it's one of the most basic things about us that defines, you know, who we are and how we view ourselves. And, uh, and yet, Douglas didn't really know that exactly. Again, he had a good approximate idea, but but never knew exactly. So he chose that uh, that date as his to celebrate as his birthday. And as you can see there, he notes that he never really he never really knew exactly and never saw any authentic record 
uh, containing it because he was born enslaved. You know, white slave owners did not traditionally keep great records about births and deaths of of slaves, and so Douglas is just one of those uh, unfortunate uh, enslaved people who fell into that category that just never really knew exactly who, uh, uh, or, or rather, when he was born. <clears throat> He also didn't know exactly who his own father was. Uh, again, not at, not at all an, uh, an atypical experience. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of enslaved people who had this exact experience, didn't really know. As you see in the quote here, that the opinion was whispered that my master was my father, meaning the white slave owner who enslaved his mother could have been Douglas's own father. But of, you know, of, of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. So he didn't know for sure, and he never really did know, but he just was never, never sure. Um, he was separated from his mother when he was an infant, and as he says there, it was common custom in that part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age. I do not recollect ever seeing my mother by the light of day. Um, so if you read Blight's book or you read some of Douglas's own writings, you know, he talks about how his mother would come to him at night when she could get away from where she was at, at, at a different by farm, and she would come to him at night and try to spend some time with him. But by the time he woke up in the morning, she was gone. <clears throat> uh, so he, of course, tried to be as close as he could to his mother, but it was very difficult because she wasn't physically close to him most of the time. And then when he was only 10 years old, she, she died. So um, he, didn't, uh, he didn't really get to spend a lot of quality time, as we would think of it today, with his mother. Um, after that, he kind of got passed around to a number of other local families. One of those families had a, the wife of the, uh, the slave owner begin to teach Douglas how to read. She was a, a proponent of education for everyone, including enslaved people. And uh, so she actually began to teach him how to read. And of course, this was, uh, this was not something that slave owners supported because they, they purposely wanted their slaves to be kept uh, uneducated and ignorant, quite frankly, because you know, as soon as you know how to read, you know, that old phrase, knowledge is power. Um, as soon as you start to you know how to read, you can start reading not only things like the Bible, which you know, a lot of people learned to read on and maybe even still do in some places. But also, you know, if you can get your hands on things like newspapers, uh, you know, suddenly you're starting to, to learn more and you're starting to question more, uh, you know, why, am, why are you in living in this condition and what can be done about it? And, and is this really just or, or fair? Um, so, so slave owners preferred that their slaves not know how to read. And of course, in this case, uh, when the husband found out that the, that the wife was, was teaching Douglas how to read, he, of course, forbade that immediately. There were other slave, <coughs> excuse me, slaves who, who had some knowledge about reading around him. And so he, he did continue to, to learn a little bit about how, uh, about how to read. And, uh, and, and exactly what slave owners feared happened with Frederick Douglass in that he started to read newspapers that were smuggled in. He started to read political pamphlets. He started to read, you know, speeches from abolitionists that were printed in papers and suddenly started to question and eventually condemn the condition in which he and, and other African Americans around him were living. Douglas eventually, because he did know how to read and was able to read the Bible, started to teach a Sunday school, kind of an informal Sunday school for other enslaved people. He then also started using the Bible to teach other enslaved people how to read. So this great gift that he had been given quietly and illicitly, uh, he started to pass that knowledge on to other enslaved people as well. Of course, when the, uh, the, the plantation owner that that he was living, uh, whose, whose land he was living on at this time, found out about this. Again, they, they reacted very violently and, and, you know, Douglas was beaten and they dispersed the Sunday school with, you know, with violence. And, and so, uh, again, slave owners definitely did not want slaves to know how to read. Douglas was eventually hired out to a very, very brutal man named Edward Covey, who had a reputation as being what they called a slave breaker, meaning he could take slaves who were especially defiant and make them compliant when they 
got had their fill of of Douglas's Douglas's questioning of of why he was had had to live in this condition. They sent him to Covey to to break him and to to make him into a you know a passive uh, enslaved person who would do exactly what he was told at all times. Douglas, however, didn't want anything to do with that, and he actually started to fight back. And Covey kind of backed off of him. Uh, Douglas grew up to be rather large, physically, you know, tall and and strong, and uh, and so by this point he was pretty much a you know a, in his teen late teens or early twenties, or you know, probably late teens. And Covey kind of backed off when he realized that Douglas wasn't going to be broken, and that he Douglas was was quite strong in his own right. So finally, in 1838, when he was 20 years old, Douglas uh, escaped. And he fled the eastern shore of Maryland, made his way first to Baltimore uh, and then further north to get away from, you know, these these abhorrent conditions that he was living in. Uh, And you can see the quote here, he bade farewell to the city of Baltimore and to that slavery, which had been my abhorrence from childhood. So uh, and this is from one of the autobiographies he wrote. He wrote, I believe, three different autobiographies. This is the last one that he wrote uh, later in life in, in the year 1881. So he fled on, again, on September 3rd, traveling north to Baltimore and then on to Haver de Grace, Maryland, and then finally through Delaware. Now, Delaware is an interesting case in that, you know, later, uh, if you know your Civil War history, you know it was a, um, what they called a border state, meaning it was, it was a state that had slavery in its, you know, within its borders, but never did secede or join and join the Confederacy. So Delaware is kind of an interesting case. The other border states, Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky. Uh, so those four states were considered border states. They all had slavery, but but did not secede and join the Confederacy, you know, 20 some years after Frederick Douglass uh, fled uh, his own enslavement. He disguised himself as a sailor. He had fake identification papers identifying him as a free African-American. And so within 24 hours of, of fleeing the eastern shore of Maryland, he had made it to Philadelphia and then continued on north to, to New York City. New York and, and New England, these were kind of the hotbeds of abolitionism in the United States uh, for the decades leading up to the Civil War. So, you know, Douglas once he made it to a place like really to Philadelphia, but especially once he got on up to New York, uh, he, um, he, he figured he was, he was safe from, uh, from being recaptured and sent back to Maryland and back into enslavement. Uh, this is a great quote from Douglas about how he felt when he finally was, you know, considered himself free uh, when he had made it to the North. Uh, I've often been asked how I felt when I first found myself on free soil. A new world had opened upon me. If life is more than breath and the quick round of blood, I lived more in one day than in a year of my slave life. So imagine, you know, that what that feeling would be like, you know, to have to be enslaved and to have no control over your own life, where you go, what you do, not even to know your own date of birth and to live that way for 20 years. And then all of a sudden in one day, your, your, your life is completely different. And so, you know, it's, it's an understandable um, sort of series of emotions that he was feeling upon becoming a free man. And so he, uh, he expressed that quite, quite deftly in his, uh, in his autobiographies. <clears throat> One of the people who had kind of facilitated his escape, and like a lot of uh, enslaved people who escaped, uh, they were helped by abolitionists and other people who were sympathetic to their plight. One of the people who helped uh, Douglas escape was Anna Murray, who was a free black woman, not enslaved, a free black woman in Baltimore. When he fled out of Maryland and then into uh, Pennsylvania and eventually up to New York, she eventually joined him uh, in, uh, in New York. And on September 15th, 1838, less than two weeks really after he had fled slavery, they were, they were married and then eventually settled uh, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. So again, you can see he's moving further and further north, trying to get further and further away from the South, understandably, um, so that he's not under any danger of being recaptured and sent back South, back into enslavement. So they, uh, they married in New York and then moved on to, uh, to settle in Massachusetts. <clears throat> Uh, Douglas got to know William Lloyd Garrison, uh, and if you know anything about this history, Garrison's name is is a very large and important one. 
Garrison was, uh, you know, a white man uh, who was a uh, just an absolute fanatical abolitionist. He's the one that started the very famous abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator. And Douglas got to know Garrison. They became friendly. And it was really Garrison who encouraged Douglas to talk about his experiences in slavery, uh, encouraged him to write. Uh, and again, Douglas published several autobiographies during his lifetime and also encouraged him to speak. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about the 18, you know, 1840s, 50s here. There wasn't a lot of, you know, going home at night and turning on the TV or playing on your iPhone. Going to hear people speak, whether it was politicians or authors or just, you know, people who had interesting experiences was not only a way to learn, but it was also a form of entertainment. And so Garrison encouraged Douglas to, to hit the lecture circuit uh, and Douglas did that and really was quite effective at that. And this is really where his reputation started to grow and people started to really know who he was and to know more about what experiences he had had in, during his enslavement. And this is how a lot of people in the North really started to learn about just how brutal a system slavery really was. You know, you had Frederick Douglass out talking and, and, and then writing. And then about 10 years later, of course, comes Uncle Tom's Cabin, the, the Harriet Beecher Stowe novel. And these things are really opening a lot of eyes in the North to just how brutal this system of enslavement in the South really is. So Douglass wrote his first autobiography in 1845, when he was less than 30 years old. <laughs> so imagine, you know, f having lived that much in such a, you know, a brief amount of years to, to already be ready to write an autobiography when you're, you know, just in your late 20s. A lot of people who saw that, uh, especially people in the South, but not exclusively Southerners, uh, said that, you know, the book had to be a fake because there's no way that, that, that a Black man could have written such a, an eloquent and, and articulate book, but it was very popular. It sold very well, and it went through several reprints. Uh, uh, yeah, nine reprints there in three years, as you see on the screen. Um, he later published two additional autobiographies, My Bondage and My Freedom in 1855, and then finally The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass in 1881. Of course, by 1881, he's, you know, uh, an, old, an older gentleman, but uh, when he first publishes Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass in 1845, you know, he's not even 30 years old yet. <clears throat> For a couple of years there in the 1840s, he, he went to Europe. And this is a great quote. And this is the one I was referring to earlier when I mentioned a quote that had a, uh, a racial term on it. Um, but I think this is a great quote where he talks about, you know, realizing that he's in now Ireland and England, and he's there under, a, you know, a, a monarchical government rather than, you know, this, the, the supposed democracy in the United States, and yet how differently he's treated in, in those places that, that are living under a monarchy. So I'll read the quote, and I, I will include the, um, you know, the, the, the racial term at the end, just because it's part of the quote, and I think it's important to, to hear what Douglas is saying. 11 days and a half gone, and I have crossed 3,000 miles of the perilous deep, Instead of a democratic government, I am under a monarchical government. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I am covered with the soft gray fog of the Emerald Isle. I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. I gaze around in vain for one who will question my equal humanity, claim me as his slave or offer me an insult. I employ a cab. I am seated beside white people. I reach the hotel. I enter the same door. I am shown into the same parlor. I dine at the same table and no one is offended. I find myself regarded and treated at every turn with the kindness and deference paid to white people. When I go to church, I am met by no upturned nose and scornful lip to tell me we don't allow niggers in here. Again, excuse pardons for the, for the language, but that's, this is the exact quote from, from Douglas. Um, and I think this is powerful where he, again, realizes he's living, he's now in this country where they have this, this monarchy and, you know, there's no pretension of all men are created equal in a place like England or Ireland at this point. And yet he's treated so much better in those countries than he is in what is really his own country. 
Douglas is born in the United States. He considers himself an American, and yet, you know, he's still dealing with a country that doesn't recognize his own humanity and his own ability and his own uh, equal rights and political rights and civil rights. So again, I think a very powerful quote there, even with the, uh, the, the racial term in it. When he came back to the United States in 1847, he started publishing uh, the North Star, which was an abolitionist newspaper. And this is an interesting period of Douglas's life because it's during this period, he actually kind of has this uh, sort of bad breakup uh, with William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison in, in, in Douglas's mind has actually become too radical on this, the, the question of abolition. So the African-American you know, former slave is saying that the white abolitionist editor is too radical. And the reason for that is Garrison, Garrison denounces the constitution. Garrison says that the, the Constitution is a pro-slavery document, which, by the way, it is, or at least it was uh, in its original form, because it included language about the three-fifths compromise and all that. So, you know, the, the Constitution initially did kind of acknowledge that slavery existed, even though it doesn't actually, it never actually uses the word slavery. Um, it does kind of um, acknowledge, you know, sort of on the sly that slavery exists. So Garrison feels like the Constitution is is a is a is a bogus document, and it should just be completely scrapped, and something new should be created that specifically abolishes slavery. Douglas does not agree. Douglas feels like the Constitution is is an important document. It is a sacred document, and it can work, but it must be changed, amended, if you will to include language that outlaws slavery. And of course, as we all know, that's eventually what happens. But this becomes such an issue between Garrison and Douglas that they eventually kind of go their separate ways. They kind of have a falling out. And Douglas you know, continues to argue that the Constitution can work, but it must be changed. And and of course, he knows it can be changed because that's why the founding fathers allowed for the amendment process. They recognized that the, that the Constitution was imperfect and that, you know, there would come times where things needed to be changed in there. And so Douglas, uh, Douglas is, is, is proposing that, that the Constitution can work, but it needs to be changed. Douglas, you know, is, is, not, a, uh, is not someone who is blind to other social issues of the day. He recognizes that there are other oppressed people in the country besides just African Americans. And of course, in, in the 1840s, one of you know the, the most prominent of those those groups is, is women. They have no political voice, they're not able to vote. In many places, they still cannot own property. They they in fact are in many places still considered the property of their either their husbands if they're married or their fathers if they're not married. Uh, and Douglas recognizes that he's not a hypocrite. He recognizes that this is also unfair. And so Douglas, while pushing for equality for African Americans and for the abolition of slavery, he also gets involved with with pushing for women's rights as well. And in fact, he was the only African American who attended the very famous 1848 Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. And uh, by the way, if you go to Seneca Falls, New York today, there is a, a national historic site there called Women's Rights National Historic Site. Douglas was there and in Seneca Falls when uh, at this very famous meeting. In this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of woman and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, this is Douglas speaking, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government of the world. So he's recognizing, you know, women make up 50% or, or more really now of the population. You know, how is it fair and just to deny that many people civil and political rights simply because of their gender. Just as it's wrong to deny that based on color of skin, it's also wrong to deny that based on gender. So in, in 1852, Douglas was invited to address a 4th of July gathering. It was actually the day after the 4th of July. It was July 5th of 1852. He's invited to speak uh, in Rochester, New York, to this uh, to this Fourth of July gathering. 
And this is one of my favorite Douglas speeches. He's very sly in this speech because he starts the speech talking about what you want to hear on the 4th of July, you know, the glory of America and, you know, the greatest country on earth and, you know, all of these, these things that, that, we, that we tell ourselves and that we like to hear on the 4th of July, you know, when we celebrate our independence. But he, he starts with that, but then he kind of lowers the boom on everybody. And the, and the, and the, the speech has gone down in history as what to the slave is the 4th of July. This is 1852. It's uh, what, about 14 years or so since Douglas himself escaped slavery, but he knows that there are still millions of enslaved African Americans in the South. And so he says, he's saying, what does the 4th of July matter to us? Because it doesn't apply to us. All men are created equal, doesn't apply to us. And so he says here, fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? So again, he's pointing out some of the, the hypocrisy of early America that, you know, uh, we celebrate independence and we, we celebrate uh, the idea that all men are created equal. And yet we have millions of people at this point in the country who, who are not extended those same liberties and that same freedom. And he's pointing that out. And that makes a lot of people very uncomfortable. Certainly it makes Southerners uncomfortable, but it makes a lot of people in the North uncomfortable as well. So, you know, it wasn't just Southerners who were uncomfortable with some of this language and some of these ideas that Douglas is, is, is throwing around. John Brown, of course, is, uh, is very well known uh, for those of you that study this era of history. He was, you know, probably maybe short of Douglas himself, the most famous abolitionist in American history, maybe more famous than Douglas, depending on your perspective. He's best known, of course, for um, the, the raid on Harper's Ferry in October of 1859, where Brown led this sort of ragtag group of, of men to take over the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. It's now West Virginia, but it was still Virginia at the time, and was hoping to seize this arsenal in order to really inspire a slave rebellion and then have the weapons to arm that slave rebellion. So Brown was, was trying to start an armed insurrection uh, against the U.S. government and be able to arm that insurrection to abolish, to, to, to get rid of slavery. So Douglas and Brown did know each other. Douglas, as you can see here, visited Brown in August of 1859, and, and, and Brown chatted with Douglas about this plan, and Douglas told him it was a terrible idea. Uh, and that he, he did not approve of it because he feared that uh, attacking federal property was just going to enrage the public and it was going to make more people even that much more militantly against the cause of freedom for, for the enslaved. Brown, of course, went ahead with the raid and we all know what happens. It fails, he's captured, and in December of 1859, he is, he is executed, he is hanged. And, you know, Douglas. Douglas fears that if people find out he talked to Brown, that they're going to blame him for being complicit in this, even though he had, he had said he thought it was a terrible idea. So Douglas actually goes to Canada for a little bit just to kind of wait out the, uh, the storm because he doesn't want to be, you know, accused of being guilty by his guilt by association with John Brown. So Douglas actually flees uh, to Canada for a little bit until things kind of die down a little bit. And then, of course, by the eight, early 1860s, we have the Civil War. And this, of course, is when, when Douglas, who's already very famous, becomes even more famous as the primary African-American voice for, uh, for not only the war being about slavery, but also for uh, promoting the idea that Black men could and should be allowed to fight for the United States. So here's just some of the some of the a few of his his great quotes from that Civil War era. 
uh, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. I urge, this is him talking to other black men. I urge you to fly to arms and smite to death the power that would bury the government and your liberty in the same hopeless grave. This is your golden opportunity. So this is Douglas trying to encourage black men once they're able to enlist and to fight not only for the country, but for their own freedom and for their own rights. Once let the black man get upon his person the brass letter U.S. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. There is no power on earth that can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship. And again, Douglas saying, you know, black men who fight for the country um, are going to be, you know, should be highly regarded and should be the first in line to, uh, to be granted full civil and political rights when the war is over. Uh, and of course, many of you probably know there was this great debate about, you know, what was the war really all about? Initially, at least, all the way up to President Abraham Lincoln, everybody said the war is about preserving the Union. But even Lincoln knew deep down that disagreements about slavery, not just the existence of slavery, but the potential expansion of slavery into other parts of the country, is really what people were disagreeing about and ultimately fighting about. And so, you know, Lincoln knew deep down that that the war could not just be about preserving the union. It had to be about preserving the union, but also making it better so that when the war was over, the country had taken a step forward. People like Frederick Douglass, people like even James Garfield, I'm contractually obligated to mention Garfield several times in every talk I do. <laughs> um, not really, but I do anyway. You know, these folks were saying, hey, this war, they were saying from day one, this is, this is about slavery. We know it's about slavery. And slavery must die for the country to come back together. But uh, Lincoln waited until, of course, you know, late, late uh, September of 1862 to issue the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And then finally, the last quote here, there is no Negro problem. The problem is whether the American people have loyalty enough, honor enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution. And I, I think that's a powerful quote too there, because that's really what Douglas is trying to do is to get us to be who we say we are. We say all men are created equal, but do we really mean that? Well, not when we're denying millions of people, you know, they're, they're, you know, any voice in the government, whether you're talking about enslaved African Americans or even women at this point. Um, so, you know, Douglas is saying that, you know, we, we say one thing about ourselves on paper and then in practice, we do something different. We need to make sure that we're, we are who we say we are. And, and, you know, you can go as far forward as 1968 and uh, hear, you know, listen to Dr. Martin Luther King talking about, you know, all we're asking you to do is be true to what you put on paper. And that's, that was a, that's a powerful, uh, a powerful message in the 1860s and in the 1960s as well. So Douglas was critical of Lincoln. We tend to think that uh, you know Douglas and Lincoln were, were the best of friends. It's not the case. Douglas was very critical of Lincoln for not making the war about slavery and about the, the, the eradication of slavery immediately upon the beginning of the war. James Garfield said the same thing. You know, Garfield advocated two days after Fort Sumter was already saying, you know, the war will soon as assume the shape of slavery and freedom. And so Douglas, Douglas and Garfield were on the same page there. And uh, so Douglas was critical of Lincoln. He wanted Lincoln to, to say publicly uh, that the war was, was about not only preserving the Union, but, but abolishing slavery. And he also wanted Black men to be able to fight. And, you know, really, it seems logical now who had a, who had a greater stake in this, in this conflict than, than Black people. Black people. I mean, of course, black men are the only ones that are going to be fighting. But, uh, but who had a greater stake in this, in the outcome of this war than than they? And uh, and so Douglas wants them to be uh, able to be to, to to volunteer or even be drafted into the army uh, to fight. And uh, and it, and uh, of course, Lincoln did finally come around on that. We all know, but it took a while. <clears throat> and finally, when when Lincoln did. He issued the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1862, which basically said, unless the Confederacy gives up and, and comes back into the fold by January 1st, 1863, the, emanci the actual Emancipation Proclamation will go into effect. The Confederacy obviously did not capitulate and did not come back into the fold. 
Uh, and so on January 1st, 1863, Lincoln signed the Permanent Emancipation Proclamation, which then did say, did, did change the character and meaning of the war and did make abolition of slavery part of what the Union was actually fighting for. And here's Douglas, you know, frustrated because it took so long, but still uh, happy that finally Lincoln has, has taken this step. And he says here, this is him uh, speaking uh, to Lincoln, we are all liberated by this proclamation. Everybody is liberated. The white man is liberated. The black man is liberated. The brave men now fighting the battles of their country against rebels and traitors are now liberated. I congratulate you upon this amazing change, the amazing approximation toward the sacred truth of human liberty. And by the way, I'll, I'll mention too that in, uh, on March 4th, 1881, when James Garfield gave his inaugural address as the 20th president, um, he says something similar in his inaugural, uh, where he talks about the ending of slavery, liberating not only the slave, but also the master. And you know, talking about how this makes the country better. It's hard, uh, but it's ultimately in the long run, it's better. Um, and so Garfield says something similar and, and maybe inspired by Douglas uh, in his own inaugural address in 1881. Douglas, again, what was, you know, certainly... Um, admired Lincoln, especially after the Emancipation Proclamation. He did recognize that Lincoln was not perfect. And, uh, and so, you know, he did sometimes say some things about Lincoln that, that today seem a little unkind, but, you know, considering the perspective he was coming from, maybe we can kind of understand that. Uh, this is a speech Douglas gave in 1876, the, the nation's centennial year, in fact. Uh, and I believe the occasion here was the unveiling of a, of a statue of Lincoln. And he says, had, had Lincoln died from any of the numerous ills to which flesh is heir, had he reached that good old age of which his vigorous constitution and his temperate habits gave promise, had he been permitted to see the end of this great work, had the solemn curtain of death come down but gradually, we should still have been smitten with a heavy grief and treasured his name lovingly. But dying as he did die by the red hand of violence, killed, assassinated, taken off without warning, not because of personal hate, for no man who knew Abraham Lincoln could hate him, but because of his fidelity to union and liberty, he is doubly dear to us and his memory will be precious forever. And of course, Douglas is right on here. I mean, every, you know, today, almost everyone considers Lincoln probably the greatest president in American history. And eh, sometimes he He's, a, he's one rung below George Washington on some rankings of presidents, but he's never lower than two. Uh, and, so, and, and so Douglas is right on here that, you know, we continue to admire Lincoln today, but we continue now to admire Douglas today as well, which I think is, is, is very appropriate. During the post-Civil War Reconstruction era, Douglas is still very active as a speaker, as a, uh, as a writer. And he's still, you know, very active in, in politics. This is the era when, of course, African Americans were, were almost all Republicans because the Republicans were the party of Lincoln and the party of abolition and the party that, that won the war and, and, and that they viewed as having freed the slaves. So, you know, Douglas is very active in, in promoting Republican candidates for, for office, including president. I love this quote, a man's right rests in three boxes, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. Um, let no man be kept from the ballot box because of his color. Let no woman be kept from the ballot box because of her sex. So you can see this is 20 or yeah, 20 years almost after the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. And Douglas is still promoting not only the cause of, of African-American rights, but the cause of women's rights as well. So he stayed uh, very consistent in his, his uh, fight for social justice on, on many different fronts for the rest of his life. He did um, support Ulysses S. Grant for, for president uh, in 1868 and 1872. This is kind of funny. Unbeknownst to him, Douglas was actually nominated for vice president that year by a very small, what we would think of today as like a third party, and that was the Equal Rights Party. The presidential candidate on that ticket was Victoria Woodhull. So the first woman in American history to actually run for president on a party ticket. Again, it's a small party. It's a you know, kind of a fringe party, I guess you would say, in, in the modern parlance, um, but notable in that, you know, the Equal Rights Party is running a, a woman for president and an African-American man for vice president. Pretty, uh, pretty progressive for 1872, for sure. 
Um, again, Douglas didn't even know for the longest time that he'd been nominated for this. And he actually served as a, a, a New York uh, elector for, for Grant that year. So um, despite the fact that he was technically running for vice president, he, he, he actually went and, uh, and served as an elector for the Republican candidate that year. Um, uh, and that was 1872 was, was the year Grant was running for his second term running for reelection. Um, Douglas entered into some some difficult uh, into a difficult period of his life here, primarily based on economic difficulties. His home burned down, which you know a lot of speculation is still out there even today that this was an arson. It was never proven, but you know it's certainly possible that that someone actually burned his house down. He had become president of a of a of a bank for African Americans, the Freedmen Savings Bank. Well, as you know, he hadn't, hadn't been president more than a month or two when the bank went belly up, and so he was out of a job. Uh, and then his final uh, newspaper that he was publishing, The New Era, failed as well. So he went into this, you know, kind of very, really difficult few years where, where his, um, his personal financial situation was, was very dicey. Yeah, Rutherford B. Hayes from, from Ohio uh, became president in early 1877. Hayes actually gave, named Frederick Douglass as a, to a civil service position, which helped, which certainly helped Douglass's uh, personal financial situation uh, by giving him a job. So he named uh, Douglass the U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia. And then it, eventually Douglass bought a home in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's, you know, he called it Cedar Hill, uh, as you can see there on the, on the slide. In 1880, uh, our own James Garfield was the Republican presidential candidate, and um, you know Hayes had had said long before he won elect he won the 1876 election, um, and there's a lot of you know he won the election. I should probably put that in quotes because of course that was a disputed election where you know he lo Hayes lost the popular vote, and then there was this electoral commission trying to determine who won electoral college votes from from three southern states. But at any rate, Hayes long before the election of 1876 had said he would only serve one term if he won. So in 1880, the Republicans needed a candidate and, and uh, they uh, eventually turned to James Garfield uh, from, from lovely mentor, Ohio. And Douglas was still very active in promoting Republican candidates for office, including the presidency. And so this is, uh, this is something, as you, and, as you can imagine, this is a quote that we use quite a bit here at James A. Garfield National Historic Site. This is Douglas on October 25th, 1880, so really just a week or so before the presidential election, where he says, to, this, he's speaking to, this is in New York City at Cooper Union, uh, he's speaking to an African-American crowd, and he says, James A. Garfield must be our president. I know, colored man, he is right on our questions, take my word for it. He is a typical American all over. He has shown us how man in the humblest circumstances can grapple with man, rise, and win. So this is Douglas really promoting Garfield for, uh, for, the, uh, for the presidency in, uh, in 1880. And of course, this is the era when, again, you know, um, African Americans are, are still largely voting Republican. There is there have been a few cracks now in, in that uh, in that you know a, a lot of African Americans feel like the Republicans have been promising them uh, a lot since the end of the Civil War, uh, but the some of the conditions in the South are still terrible. They're not you know they're still being a lot of Southern states are you know being taken over again by by um, white supremacists. And so there's there's some African Americans who are kind of getting a little frustrated with the Republican Party, and this is this is. Douglas trying to to sort of bring them back into the fold and convince them that you know Garfield should be should be president. Gar, you know, a Republican president Garfield is is still better than a than a Democratic president Winfield Scott Hancock, who was the Democratic candidate that year. Something else that's interesting to note here: on the very same day that Gar, that uh, Douglas made this speech, he made this speech in the evening. Earlier that day. James Garfield had hosted right here at his home where I'm sitting here in Mentor, he had hosted a large uh, contingent of African-American Civil War veterans and had spoken to them as well. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, you know, interest in, in Garfield's candidacy among African-Americans, certainly as the, uh, as, the, as the campaign was winding down and, and the election was about a week away. <clears throat> And of course, since you, if you didn't know, Garfield did win. It was a very close election, the closest popular vote 
margin in American history. He won by something less than 10,000 votes out of several million cast, but he did win the popular vote and did win a significant victory in the Electoral College as well. Like Hayes before him, Garfield appointed Frederick Douglass to a civil service position. He made Douglass the recorder of deeds for the District of Columbia. Garfield also named uh, another very well-known African-American uh, by the name of Blanche Bruce, uh, who had, had been a U.S. senator from Mississippi uh, during Reconstruction. He named Blanche Bruce as the Register of the United States Treasury. So Garfield did appoint African-Americans to some uh, civil service positions during his very brief presidency. The same year that he became the Register of Deeds for District of Columbia, Douglas also published that final autobiography, uh, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. Uh, Douglas's wife, uh, Anna, who you may recall, he had married you know, just after escaping from enslavement in Maryland. Uh, she died in 1882 after 44 years of marriage. Uh, a couple of years after that, he got remarried. And this remarriage was uh, a little bit controversial because his new wife was considerably younger, but she was also a white woman. Um, uh, Helen Pitts was her name, and so she became Helen Pitts Douglas, but uh, uh, he did remarry uh, after his first wife died to a, a much younger and, and to a white, uh, a white woman, Helen Pitts. Uh, at the Republican convention in 1888, Douglas uh, received a voice vote for president. Uh, this was the first time that an African-American had ever received a vote uh, for president in a major party's uh, convention. So that's worth noting. And then of course, as happens to all of us eventually, Douglas, uh, Douglas did, uh, did die uh, on February 20th, 1895. So he had just passed his 77th birthday. And again, recall that that birthday was unofficial uh, because he never really knew exactly his own date of birth, but he dated himself from February 14th of 1818. His funeral was held in, uh, in an African Methodist Episcopal Church in, in Washington, D.C., and then his body was sent up to Rochester, New York, uh, where he had lived for some time and was interred next to his first wife, uh, Anna Murray Douglas, the one to whom he had been married for, uh, for 40, 44 years. And uh, incidentally, this is the same cemetery in which Susan B. Anthony is buried. So again, you know, we talked about Douglas being not only fighting for the rights of, of enslaved people and African Americans, but also for women. And here he's in this, he's buried in the same cemetery as the great uh, suffrage, uh, suffrage advocate, Susan B. Anthony. Just a few great quotes here from, from Douglas. Probably my, uh, my favorite is the one where he talks here about, you know, uh, he says, I prayed for 20 years, but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. And so he's obviously referring there to, um, to his, you know, when he decided to make the escape from enslavement in, uh, in Maryland. Um, so uh, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Uh, that speaks to, you know, greatly to the value of education and really even goes back to the idea that, you know, slaves were purposely not taught to read and were purposely kept ignorant um, because, exa of, because of exactly what Douglas says there, that the more you know, uh, the more you're going to ask questions and the more you're going to, uh, you're, the more you're going to, uh, to be uh, willing to, to, to stand up for yourself and say that something's, something's not right and it's, it's unjust and it's unfair. And then I'll also mention that um, this, is, this is that Cedar Hill home that Douglas um, bought when he was uh, working as the uh, U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia. Today, this is administered by us, the National Park Service, as Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. So if you're interested in, uh, if you're going, you know, someday when we can all travel again, uh, when this pandemic has finally ended, um, and you want to go make a trip to D.C., if you're going there for, uh, for anything, you can, you can visit Frederick Douglass National Historic Site and learn a lot more about who Frederick Douglass was and, uh, and, and what he did and what he accomplished. So... Thank you.